Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Honor the Feminine podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Ledford, and we've really stepped into the Shame Game series. And today, for episode 105, um, Shame Game series number six, we're going to sit down with Maria Carrillo. Up to this point, these episodes have been just me, and they've really... um, They've really built on one another, and they start at episode 100. Today's a bit of a step back from that, and this we're going to talk about how the, the origins of the Shame Game series came about. You're welcome to go back to episode 100 and, and feel more deeply into all of the Shame Game stuff that's come up. But today, Maria and I are going to jam around the shame of being a woman, and all that comes up with that. So we're going to begin, like we've begun all of these episodes, with a card from the Mother Mary Oracle by Alana Fairchild. And today what came forth was Our Lady of the Sacred Sun, number 15. And this card is about the consciousness of love that belongs to each and every human soul, so to each and every one of us. And we each carry that divine flame of love within us. This card, because it speaks to the sun and the Christ consciousness of love, also steps into that divine awakening of the sacred masculine within each of us. And it's interesting to have the awakening of the sacred masculine come up on a day when we're going to talk about being a woman. So... (laughs) One of the reasons that I invited Maria to join me today is because the origins of I'm a no to shame came out of a conversation that she and I and a couple of other dear women in our lives um, had together. We actually meet, meet weekly and it's one of the reminders that I have that while we do the work on ourselves, we don't do it alone. And it's in these places where some of our our old stories can be uh, identified so that we know them better and make more choices around them. And I'm just deeply grateful for those spaces. So, Maria, welcome. Mm, Thank you, Shannon. I'm so excited to be here with you. So let's talk about shame and maybe we can start at that conversation and what it sparked for you. Sure. That sounds great. Yeah. So it was a couple of months ago that we've had it now. Mm -hmm. We've had some time to digest it a little. (laughs) (laughs) We need that time. (laughs) Definitely. It was a big, a big awakening. (laughs) Yeah. So we were having a lovely conversation around carrying the shame of others and how shame is something that we don't come into this world with, right? We come into this world right from that, like the card said, like we're this divine spark of love and we embody that love when we come through. And then the world just seems to start to pile stuff on top of us, including shame and others can ask us to carry it for them. And within you, it struck a chord that was very different from the chord that struck within me and yet still very much related. And so one of the pieces of shame that I've been unraveling for a really long time is the shame around being a woman. And I was attuned to this shame from a very young age. Like I could even tell you that being a woman, like I didn't feel comfortable as a girl in my physical body this physical form didn't feel safe here. There wasn't a place where I felt held um, by the masculine or by the feminine. I kind of felt like I was just hanging out on my own. And as a result, um, I shut down my innate feminine gifts. Mm -hmm. And it's taken a long time to sort of find the words and to unravel the pain of the shame. Like there's so many ways that it then impacts our lives. Right. And for me, I felt it. So on a physical level, that meant that my body wasn't acceptable. Right. And so 
I always laugh. Like the irony is that I, I'm quite voluptuous, right? I'm curvy and big breasted and look like those goddess figures, right? That you see sculpted. And my, um, one of my mentors, she's like, of course, like, of course you have this very like stereotypical feminine form, like, and you're so ashamed of it. And as I, to be, began to develop as a child physically, like I would wear clothes to try to hide my my body. Mm-hmm. I stopped swimming. I quit dance class at the age of six because I felt so insecure about my physical body. And then it turned into um, starting at the age of about 11 or 12, chronic yo-yo dieting um, for 25 years. And so there was the physical aspect, but then there was the, the aspects of the feminine that aren't quite as um, clear cut, if you will, like visible. There is the way we connect with the unseen world around us. There are all of our mystical um, senses, right? Our innate capacity to know and feel and perceive. So I was ashamed of my, the way I felt the world very deeply. Um, I, and the way this starts to trans um, or show up as a wound in myself and many other women who have now are on the other side of it is that we go into a place of self doubt and we disconnect from our innate wisdom and we shut down in our ability to speak right? Our voice is effective. The way we show up in the world, we don't want to be seen. There are so many layers to how I carry this shame and so many other women who um, are on an awakened spiritual path to embody the feminine, similar wounds that they hold as well. Yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. 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 And the, yeah. And, and the, the, what the, what you're talking about with it being sort of put upon us, it like, it feels like to me, it like shapes this lens Mm -hmm. where, and a wounded lens where then everything that I'm perceiving or so much of what I'm perceiving is coming through that lens. And so Mm -hmm. for me, it's been about starting to break that down and become more aware of when it's coming through that wounded lens that's it. And then in order to stay safe, like we organize our world through this lens. And so, and, and the ego wants to be right, right? When we're right, then we feel safe. And so then we continue to look for situations that prove that, yeah, this is the way the world is. Like I, it's not safe for me to speak up. It's not safe for me to, to have this, this feminine body. It's not safe for me to trust my wisdom. And it takes deconstructing that lens to understand that that is a lens put upon us by the patriarchal structure that we live within. And I want to be clear that the patriarchal structure is not a masculine, divine masculine structure, right? It's a structure, it's a a mental construct. It's a political ideology, if you will, or a philosophical ideology that was constructed to um, perpetuate a power dynamic between those who. And at the time, we're predominantly male, right, put into place. But because the male was so disconnected from the feminine already, that was the only way they knew how, right? That's what felt safe to them. That was their lens that they saw the world through. And so now we're in a place of deconstructing um, this lens within ourself. And I always like to say we're the microcosm within the macrocosm. And so as we deconstruct this lens within ourselves, that lends to the deconstruction of this lens for the, the entire world, right? We're starting to break down those patriarchal structures that hold us locked into shame. Like that's how, what better way to disempower somebody than by making them feel ashamed of who they are. Yeah, that's so yeah. true. And for me, sometimes there's this, you know, break down the patriarchy and then sometimes what comes right on the heels of that is bring in the matriarchy. Mm, right. And for me, that's as much of a loser. Yes. To be honest. Um, because it's not, it's about the wounded lens versus the divine, the love lens, mm-hmm. right? the, the lens of the divine. And 
the divine has both the divine feminine and the divine masculine doing a dance together within each of us, within the world. That's where we find the love that we were, that the, that the Oracle card alluded to. Spoke actually yes. very overtly about that we allude to, actually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, truth in our laps right there. It's, that's yeah. it. No, and this is it. Like, we're in a really unique time and place in the like, human memory, like in our DNA. I don't know that we've ever lived fully in balance with the masculine and feminine before, right? So it is this, it's a really a steep learning curve right now. Like things are moving fast as we're dismantling the patriarchy within, um, which I like to refer to in my work. And we're embodying a completely new consciousness. And it is based on this notion of divine love, but we've never fully experienced that. Like what does Christ consciousness even mean? Right. And when we say Christ consciousness, that is not necessarily Jesus Christ on his own as a, as a male figure, right? Christed consciousness is divine union between the masculine and the feminine. So the person that is being left out of this story is Mary Magdalene, his counterpoint, right? She's the divine feminine figurehead, if you will, of this consciousness, this movement of consciousness. And she's been such a huge, um, force in my own unraveling of this lens of my own healing around shame. Yeah. And so I just would really love to presence her in this conversation. And I know you're down with that, Shannon. <laughs> I am. I'm so down with that. And I just, I just want to be, uh, I want to be really clear about the mother Mary Oracle cards aren't mm-hmm. that that isn't Mary Magdalene. Right. Right. Like they're, they're, they're separate. Um, archetypal energies, they're separate forces. Yes. They activate different parts. Mother Mary's come in really beautifully to hold this series for me because for me, she brings a lot of love. I feel really held by her. She brings a lot of ease and grace that um, as a being, I tend to lack. (laughs) And that felt, um, it was a really strong pull for me, a really strong signal to, to bring her, to presence her in each of these episodes through the Oracle cards. But Mary Magdalene is a different energy. Mm -hmm. She's a very different energy. And it's interesting. I've been interviewing women for a series called Walking with the Magdalene. Mm -hmm. That'll be coming out probably in, in May or so. And everyone connects with her as an archetype in a different way. So I think it's important to understand that when we work with these archetypes of consciousness, whether it's Jesus or Mother Mary or Mary Magdalene or others, is that they aren't just one thing, right? We're not, we're not tapping into necessarily their human experience that they lived, like their historical human experience. That is a part of it. But now they are ascended masters. Like they, they're in a different, um, subtle energy field than we are and they represent something greater right and so mary magdalene will be different for each woman and that's something that through my interview series i you know it became very evident and because for me well i'll i'll backtrack for a moment most women really resonate with this idea that she holds the field of unconditional love which is true Absolutely. And she is, a lot of people call it the Christed Magdalene consciousness that is coming through. And so this is idea of the masculine voice has been very prevalent, right? But now it's the feminine voice. So she's giving space for the feminine voice. And yet we're not forgetting the divine union, how the two work together, these two aspects of consciousness. And so they're coming together to birth something new. Okay. So The field of unconditional love, yes, she's holding this because this is where we are moving towards in this new paradigm that we haven't, we're we're just trying to understand, right? But for me in particular, she also holds this fierce um, game changer energy, right? This fierce sacred rebellion energy. And if we go back to look at the historical aspect of her and Jesus as um, as leaders, they came forth in a time when 
they were completely against the norm, right? Like they were, they were speaking out against a very entrenched system of religion through the Jewish faith and also through the Romans. Yeah. And the Romans, you know, being some of the first colonialists <laughs> and, and, and conquering all these other lands. And Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a very different message. Like fe- women did not have a voice back then either. Um, they were very much, they were, they were seen as property. They were seen as serving um, the, the masculine and being there to take care of home and ch- children. Like we haven't actually evolved all that much since those times, you know, 2000 some years ago. And here these two teachers come through and they're talking about divine love, right? They're talking about the unity of masculine and feminine. They're talking about um, using sex magic, like bringing together the masculine and feminine to create higher levels of consciousness. And they went around to the people and they were shaking things up. And so here's a woman who used her voice who was not ashamed of her sexuality, who understood the feminine principle of this innate wisdom of creation. Like we hold the creative force in our body. And she knew this and she taught this. And now she's coming back through as an ascended master to help us embody those qualities. And so for me, like my, it's the church that painted her as a fallen woman, right? Who labeled her as um, a prostitute who's then saved by Jesus. And we're back to the wounded lens. Back to the wounded lens, right? And so here I've come into this world and I embody this shame that was put upon this archetype, right? This person in history. And as a collective, we were all birthed into that, mm-hmm. right? Like you can be the virgin pure, clean Mary, or you can be the loose, you know, whoring Mary Magdalene. Like, which which one are you, right? There isn't a lot of room for us. Um, I laugh because <laughs> my warrior energy has so much black and white, and I, I yes. talk about that on one of, on one of these right. episodes, and, and how sometimes that doesn't serve me that well, but you've just connected for me the wounded lens between the two, right? I mean, there was just a black and white. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 We very much came into that. Whether or not, like I never went to church. I wasn't ra- raised religiously. So regardless, it, it's being held in our, at least in the Western, um, Western society where the predominant religion or faith belief system is Catholicism and Christianity, right? Like that, that's held for us. Um, and so for me to unwind it, as I started to learn the story of Mary Magdalene, the the threads of truth of her story, it helped me to start to embody a different type of archetype that was not given to us, you know, 2000 some years ago. Where is this embodied woman who, who like connects with the curves of her body, her sensuality, her, her potency to bring forth life, right? The woman who knows and feels and, and moves with the cycles of the earth uh, brings forth creation. Like, where is she? And that's who's waking up for us. And, she, and Mary Magdalene is holding that frequency for us now. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? That, yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah, that makes sense. It it makes me think back to when you were saying, you know, it's been a long time since the divine masculine and the divine feminine danced in this divine love. I mean, it's been thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. But it did at one point. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that actually lives in ourselves too. As well. That's right. Yeah. It, it, they yeah. both do. All, all of these years of more wounded and, and the ancestors, all of that lives in ourselves too. It's part of what it feels like we're de rubbling. Mm-hmm. And um, can you talk a little bit? Because here's a curiosity I'm having right now. So the archetypal energies, right? Mm-hmm. And um, getting attuned to them and that making shifts. How has the how has it then moved into your actual human being self does that make sense yeah. because i'm finding right now i have a bit of a disconnect between all these beautiful things that have happened energetically for me 
but having space in my body with all of the rubble that we were just, that I was just speaking to from the ancestors and all of this Mm -hmm. lineage. Yeah. Like, how do we make sense of this? Like, how do we work with it? How does it impact us? And it's a really good question. And for me, it started with reading books about Mary Magdalene. Fiction books, but based, you know, we pull, fiction comes through inspiration and inspiration comes from the divine. So there's threads of truth in it, right? Fiction's my favorite. Yeah. Like, it's amazing how people can tap into that. And as I start to read the stories and come up with a different concept, a way of being, um, that gives me courage. It gives me permission that I don't actually need from anybody but myself, but it gives me permission to to move through this world in a different way. Hmm. And then <laughs> having my, my fierce circle of healers around me, right, delving into those old stories, doing the shadow work, right? Like looking at like there's different levels to us. There's the energetic. So what are the energetic imbalances in the chakras and our energetic system that are holding on to the outdated stories, this lens? And then what are the mental constructs starting to break those down? Because as much as we do work on the energetic field, it's not going to, we have to embody it, right? Like that's what we embody, we're embodied, um, consciousness is what we are as humans, right? Mm -hmm. So then how do we embody that energetic shift? It's through our mental construct, right? And it's through the choices that we make. It's by, you know, the old yogic yogic technique of watching your breath, taking a step back to be the witness of your experience, Mm -hmm. choosing, not necessarily, I don't have a little trouble with, you know, choosing your thoughts, but be paying attention to your Mm -hmm. thoughts and then you know, talking yourself through, okay, I see where this thought is coming from. This is attached to the old lens, but now I have an experience um, through this archetypal energy, this story of a different way of being. Mm. So what are the different choices I can make? And for me, I mean, it's been two years now and my shame was thrown right in my face by a very (laughs) innocuous comment by dear sister of ours and it, it made me realize that I, like this shame that I held around my, my body, my sexuality, my sensuality, I honestly thought like, maybe this box just stays closed for this lifetime. I don't think I want to look at it. And she made this comment and I went into such adverse, like PTSD reaction, trauma reaction, um, that I'm like, no, it's time. And then I was ready to look at my story of my own um, sexual trauma as a child. And that is when I first really felt held by Mary Magdalene, where I energetically felt her come in and started meditating with her, journaling with her, and listening to the wisdom. And that was the hardest piece. I was so disconnected from trusting my own intuition. I was, I was disconnected from trusting the divine, even though I was a spiritual teacher, right? And so allowing myself to fully feel my pain of the trauma and what it, um, how it impacted me and doing that deep shadow work. And again, it was energetic, it was emotional, it was psychological, it was all these different levels. I was able then to see the gift on the other side which is this new embodied archetype we've been talking about, right? This, I call it the mystically conscious embodied woman, the woman who is fully connected to her truth, her voice, her creative cycles, her ability to speak up against um, anything less than love and call in this new consciousness that's being birthed of divine love. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I've just spoken on an episode in the Shame Game series around those shadow pieces. They're still with us. You you don't just like clear them out or sweep them away. But the biggest thing for me is that part of me still lives. And recently, you know, it came up again and I can I can see the she doesn't know what she's talking about. See, I knew it. I don't trust her. All of those things. 
And that part, I acknowledge that part of me. Mm -hmm. But I also very much realized that used to be my truth. That used to that blame outside of myself or see, I didn't even have to go through this. That used to just be my truth. Mm -hmm. And now there's this space energetically and in my body, some, there's, mm-hmm. there's still, that, that seems to be the disconnect for me right now is like, you know, creating more space in my body. So my, like letting go of some of that trauma in my cells mm-hmm. actually, um, to be like, no, look at all the beautiful additional things that came out of this, this mm-hmm. medicine. Um, but I have to acknowledge, like, it's not as much as I can see all of, you know, not carrying my mom's story forward and walking her path, how deeply held I am um, and supported by the women and the men and women in my life. That's all gorgeous. But I still have. See if I didn't need to go through that. Because that was hard. Yeah. To get yeah. there. Yeah. It is hard. Yeah. And, but I do think. I think moments. It, moments. It's getting, I think we're being supported so that it doesn't have to be so hard. I agree with that because I will tell you that with things sort of falling in on me and being in that real trauma, you know, I had that in my 20s and it took years Mm -hmm. to unravel that enough to feel even slightly whole. Yeah. And this took a couple of weeks. It's a big difference, right? but yeah. I also would have told you a month ago that was healed a long time ago and I'm done with that now. Right. And I, <laughs> I just did a post about this the other day. It's, you know, there's no quick fix. No, no one can tell you do A, B, and C and you'll get to Z. I'm Canadian. Z, Z. <laughs> um, it's not linear. Our healing path isn't linear. I talk about it all the time, but then when it spirals around... <laughs> I have the linear thoughts of, right. but I've dealt with I've it. done this. <laughs> Maybe all this that I think I've done, I didn't do. <laughs> yeah, or I did it wrong. Right? <laughs> like, I didn't do it right. I didn't fix it. And we're not here to fix ourselves. We're here to unwind the layers of shit that have been put on us or that we've carried through intergenerationally or through past lives to, to transmute, to alchemize, to heal. Right. And it's, it's a dance and it's an ebb and flow and it's a spiral, right? It's, and we revisit these things time and again. And the initial opening the box of shame was related to the masculine, right? This masculine that placed shame upon me this masculine transgression. It took me two years to work through that. And the first year was like, I was like, what have I done? Like my life was not that bad. I walked that with you. (laughs) You did. Like it was awful, but I knew I had to go because I knew what was on the other side. I had done easier. I had stripped away easier shadows, easier stories. So I knew what was waiting for me on the other side and I was so beautifully supported on all levels, energetically, physically, you know, through my family, through my friends, and through through the energetic realms, my guides and Mary Magdalene. And so then when another layer of shame came through recently with the feminine, that unwound itself really fast. I mean, it's still, I'm still working on it. It was triggered um, at Christmas time. And that's just three months ago. Like the way I've moved through it is so much faster because yes, I've done it before. I understand the process and I think, I really do think it doesn't have to be as hard as we maybe make healing out to be because we're so, if we have such a, a grip on those stories, like I said at the start, like the ego wants to feel safe by being in what's feel, what is familiar. Even if it's uncomfortable, it's familiar. It wants to prove itself Right. I'm safe if I orient myself this way. And so it holds on so tight. But if we're willing to, to, to see that we are supported to actually move through this, it can be a lot more graceful. And I think this is a beautiful place to just re-tap into, we do our healing on our own, but 
those that have walked with us for a while and can reflect like, hey, what you're doing is amazing and so much quicker. And do you remember this? Mm -hmm. We forget. We forget. And so that we hold, that we can hold the stories for each other and, and the containers for each other to do some of this. There, it's important. Yeah. And one of the wounds that we're healing as a collective is um, the isolation that we feel like we have to do it alone. That story is, runs through every every human being, I, I believe, to a certain extent. Some of us can can move through it really quickly, but for some, like me, it's a lot harder because um, there's a place of feeling very, when we're not supported from initially by the masculine or the feminine, there's a place of, okay, well, I'm in and alone. And if I don't trust myself, I don't trust the divine, then I'm in it alone, right? But once we can open ourselves up to see, like we say it all the time, like we're no different than the the pack of wolves that run together, right? The the collective of elephants that care for each other. Like we're we're the same. We need that support and community. And I would always, always say to people, like when you're going through this deep, deep stuff you need to have support professional and otherwise, yeah. right? You need to, to tap into the wisdom of those who have walked before you and they're not here to do it for you. Right. No. Like in my work, I'm very clear with my clients. I'm not doing this for you, but I'm giving you the access points, the tools, the practices, the possibility of moving through this, but ultimately it's your story, your journey, and it's going to look different for each individual. Um, I think there's a moment too to speak into just the caution around not getting, not holding on to the idea that in the suffering, you are evolving. That if you are not suffering, you are not evolving and getting sort of that idea of sort of addicted to the suffering. Yes. Um, So I just wanted to voice that because I, I think that can happen as well. Like, well, oh, yes, I'm not suffering, totally. I'm not growing and evolving. No, and and that's what we're unwinding. That's why it's going to be easier, is yes. because we don't have to suffer. We go into the underworld to come back up. We don't have to stay down there, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can't just live in love and light, but we go down into the underworld. We come back up because that's where the gifts are, right? But yeah, and again, you know, it's it's the dance. It's the yeah, the masculine and feminine. It's the light and the dark. It's not forsaking one for the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that ties in so beautifully to the idea of, you know, the divine union, because we sit in that still point then of heaven and earth of, Mm -hmm. we find grace there in the healing. And so in those moments of like the second time, as I was healing the shame with the feminine, it was, okay, here I am again. Okay. Well, I know how to do this. I'm going to invite Grace and I'm going to invite in my support and I can breathe through this really quickly. I don't need to suffer this time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the same extent, in the same way, just so that I can feel like I'm evolving. That's right. Growing or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It has been interesting though, since that conversation where it's like, I'm a no to shame. You know, I started the series with, well, Duh, Shannon, everybody's a no to shame. But I had all these places in which even consciously being a no to shame, I had places where it was still really lived within me. And it's become very clear that this is no joke. My intention for surrender this year and the declaration that I'm a no to shame has brought up tidal waves of my deepest shame that mm-hmm. I would have told you I had healed already. Yeah. It's fascinating. And this, again, this is why it's multi-layered. It's not just on the mental, it's on emotional, psychological, energetic, right? It's all the layers. That's where we're being asked to heal. Doing one is helpful, but you're not getting to the root of it, right? You're not excavating and getting it out. Yeah, we can. And we are so addicted to suffering (laughs) in this world. So, and, and it's because that is sort of our norm. That's the accepted way of being. 
we think we've moved through, but we haven't actually, because it still feels good to perpetuate that cycle or not good, but familiar. 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 So smart. Yeah. It's familiar. Yeah. And sometimes it can get reinforced with some of the mentors that we bring in too. And so Mm -hmm. just to, um, I've had that experience too. So watching for that feels important for me. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely understand that too. And I, that's, I'm at a point of, of really looking at my own work carefully right now. Am I perpetuating suffering? Oh yeah. Right. With my clients. Am I, am I, what is my relationship to suffering? So that's very much in my consciousness right now. And how do we, yeah, make it more graceful and useful, just like we've been talking. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. There's no recipe. It's not three cups of compassion and you know two tablespoons no. of, you know, all, all wrapped in a package of divine love. Exactly. You got it. We're, we're constantly, um, yeah, we're constantly in flux. And, and for me, it's about part of the thing around the shame is now putting a light on it so that it doesn't live within me in the same way. And that's yeah. what the series has been about. Yeah. It's a beautiful, powerful series, you know, cause we do all carry this shame. Like it's, and it's going to show up in different ways for different people. Um, but I really feel that the threads, there are so many common threads to it. Right. So as we listen to other people's stories, it helps them it's a, that's an access point too, because then we can reflect on how does that show up in my life? No, it's not quite the same, but okay, here's my story. And yeah, I do actually carry this. And so then getting curious about, okay, how do I release this now? Yeah. Yeah. That, that universal, that, that tidal wave of shame around I'm broken. I knew I was Mm -hmm. broken and because I'm broken, I'm not lovable. Yeah. Here's the divine comedy of that is we all think we're broken in some way yeah, and are spending a lot of energy hiding that away when the reality for me has been, as I've spoken into it more, it creates connection with other yeah. people. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, exactly. The and thing then, I think that's going to make me unlovable actually it connects you. creates more connection for yeah. love. Because people are like, oh, I feel that way too. Yeah. And then you give them permission to actually release it. Oh, I don't have to. And then ultimately the only thing that is broken is our link to our divinity, to, to divine love, to our acceptance of us as whole spiritual beings. That's what's broken, not us. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it feels universal as I've begun to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, walking as a human being is a is an interesting fascinating journey. Oh, it's such a fascinating journey. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> just <laughs> the day when I leave my physical form will be so enlightened. It'll be like, "Oh, I get it." <laughs> I've been working some with the ancestors and there's, there's always this reminder that because they don't have human bodies to negotiate with, they, there is this sense that of transformation more quickly because you aren't negotiating all of the, the being mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. Um, which is a beautiful reminder for me, actually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much... And, you know, going back to the conversation around suffering, like we can get trapped in that. There's so much more to the human experience than just being in our stuff, right? And like, that's the (laughs) gift of being here is we get to play, we get to eat, we get to make love, we get to, you know, call on all of our senses, be in nature, see the beauty in this world. Like, and that's something that I lost with shame. That's something that I disconnected from was just being free and playful. Oh, here, actually, this, this is something I wanted to bring up too. The shame often resides in our, as a woman, it resides in our womb, energetic womb space in our second chakra. The second chakra is also the seat of joy and childlike wonder and play and creativity. Yeah. Right. And so when you lose, you lose that to shame. 
And so for me, what's coming through is just this, I've been getting these messages to play for about 10 years since my first child was born. I'm like, I don't want to. It's like, I resist it. And then when I start playing, like going into imaginary games or whatnot, I just, I take off. It's so much fun. And now finally, um, in the last really few months, I'm like, oh, I'm starting to understand that just playing and being joyful. I'm so disconnected from my joy. I may have been happy in moments, but joy is different, right? Joy is so different. And finding that has been so amazing. And it there's this layer of heaviness that has been released from me so that I can, because I feel safer now as I release my shame, I can play more with my husband and with my kids and be more, I'm, we've had conversations. I'm quite playful by nature, but most people wouldn't necessarily know that unless they know me because I, my, my armor was I'm serious, right? Because the playfulness was what was stolen by the shame of being a woman. And so now that it's leaving, like we were just in Disney world, um, playing, for 10 days in and out of the parks. And I've come home. I'm like, I just want to keep playing. And we've been going to the pool and we've been having dance parties. I'm like, wow, I was so committed to this, this lens of suffering because I was in my shame that I was missing out on the joyful part of being human. Not all the time, but you know, there was, or rather there was more there was more, there was more joy to be had. There was more abundance of love and connection and beauty to be had. And that is the gift that's coming through now really, really strongly. Oh, that's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us about walking with the Magdalene and the journey you're going to take in October? Yes. So I'm committed to giving women experiences where they can start to release some of these stories and woundings that we've been talking about around um, their shame, around the feminine. And these experiences have led me, my own journey took me, healing journey took me to France to connect with sacred sites associated with divine feminine and with Mary Magdalene. After the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene and some of her, um, her entourage, if you will, her peer, her, her colleagues, they set sail and landed in France and their her homies, t- <laughs> her homies, her spiritual homies, um, it's well documented they landed in France and that's where they continued the teachings of um, Christed consciousness. And so there are particular sites that when I went there, what was so beautiful, I was following the path of Mary Magdalene. There's sites where she landed, um, a beautiful mountain called Saint Baume in the South of France, where she was said to have lived the last 30 years of her life. Mm. Beautiful monuments erected in her name. In France, they have a very different relationship to her than they do over in North America. Her story and the story of persecution has not taken root like it has over in North America. And so there's all these beautiful places associated with her. And as I went to these places, I realized that the roots were deeper than her right? That this consciousness, this Christed consciousness is transcends Mary Magdalene and Jesus. They were just bringing it through at that time as they are in this time again. And these sites were revered places of potent energy to activate the divine feminine. It's where the divine feminine was revered and honored and people people in their hum- human form came to commune energetically with the source of the divine feminine. And so going to these beautiful sites helps to, it's twofold. One, it helps us to reactivate and remember our divine feminine essence, but it, this, the information, the codes, if you will, of the divine feminine also live within that land. Like you said, we're in a process. It's not that this, this, consciousness of love and divine union has um, never been experienced within ourselves. It has, and it's been embedded in this land, 
but it's still kind of asleep in some places. And so as we go back and we remember reactivate, the land also awakens, this knowledge is coming out. So it's like this symbiotic relationship. And so in the fall, I'm taking a group of um, 13 women, inviting a group of 13 women to come with me to the south of France to experience this reawakening, this reconnection with their divine feminine. Whether you've been walking this path for a long time or not is irrelevant because there's always deeper layers. Um, you'll Amen have to that. Yeah, right? <laughs> and there's always layers to release. And the land there is so beautiful. It's so mystical. It's so ancient. And the history is so rich. Um, the Druids walked there prior to and did all their energetic work there as well. So the retreat's going to be, we're presencing beauty as medicine. When we are held in beauty, our nervous system can relax and women need to feel fully safe to open, right? To receive on all levels. And so we'll be staying in beautiful um, old heritage buildings and sites, beautiful land, having beautiful catered meals and have a personal tour guide to take us to some of these sites as we go into mystical ritual healing places and attunements and activations. Um, and it's all being held in the frequency of Mary Magdalene as our ascended, our ascended teacher and guide on this trip. Oh, beautiful. And so where do we go to learn more about that? Uh, my website, mariacarillo.com, will share the link with you. Um, and the retreat's called Awaken the Magdalene. Mm-hmm. And so all the information's there. And the early bird, car- early bird pricing cart opens April 18th. So we will have the link on the show notes for this episode over at honorthefeminine.com. So it's really easy to find. And Maria, thank you for today. Thank you for, um, you know, thank you not just for joining me today, but for being in constant conversation together around just important stuff. It's, mm-hmm. um, it feels really beautiful and really important to me. We're not alone. <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy to be walking this path with you. Hello again, everyone. It was so amazing to be with Maria and to share her with you today. It was beautiful for me because it was in a space with her and a couple of other gorgeous women that we really started to dive into shame and call out like, that feels like shame. And... So that's where the shame game was born. And Maria, Maria's work is incredible. Uh, We've known each other a while and to watch her and her work continue to unfold and deepen is really been, it's really just been incredible. And as it comes together for her retreat in France with the Magdalene in October, it feels so right. And so if that lights you up at all, if you've got that little inkling of, I should check that out, please do. So it's over at mariacarillo.com. And you can also go, there'll be links on the show notes at honorthefeminine.com in the show notes for this episode. Over here at the Honor the Feminine podcast, I also have a couple of offerings that are open right now. If you're listening to this contemporaneously in May 2018, the I'm doing... Um, the fire activation series, which is a way to dive deeper together. And it's three months of one-to-one. So six one-to-ones where we meet and create clarity and action steps to move forward for a project that you've wanted to do for a life transition where there may be some resistance and I'm really excited about this work. And so the fire activation series will begin May 23rd. I'm also doing a second section of the Down and Dirty podcast course. 
So if your dream is to podcast, this group program begins May 27th. And it's more than just the technical and the workflows and the systems for podcasting. It's really a place to start to untangle how you want to step in and share your voice and express your truth. All right, everyone. Have a beautiful day.